Stay Prayed Up And how we go to The ideal of a constitutional republic is individual liberty. In this century, great strides have been made toward the goal of subverting our republic and transforming it into a democracy. The foremost tactic of the subverters is subversion of language. By calling America a democracy until people thoughtlessly accept and use the term, totalitarians have obscured the real meaning of American principles of government. So I'm um, I'm sorry I'm confused. Um, are you are you Mr. Darren? Miss Darren? No, I am Teacher Darren. There would be no Mr. or Mrs. in front of that. Just <laughs> Teacher Darren. I'm confused. I guess I'm confused. What are you confused about? The hall again after the encounter. The two founders of AA were originally introduced to each other by a woman named Henrietta. In a 1952 letter. She wrote about how Wilson often communicated with spirits during the time period he formulated the Alcoholics Anonymous program. The official Alcoholics Anonymous biography of Wilson reveals that even years after the founding of AA, seances were still being regularly held at the Wilson residence. Consulting the Ouija board was also a regular practice. The biographer writes... You guys, oh my God, watch this. So we got to talk about something very, very important because when you see this happen, understand what this means. We're going to talk about a $50 minimum, minimum wage throughout America. And why would America make a federally uh, law to make minimum wage $50 an hour? Well, guys, right now, I believe that we are in the first stages of the dollar being replaced. So, what you sound a little different than my pastor. Why? Because you gave the pastor the final authority, not the word of God. And then when your pastor comes up with a view or a motive, you support that view and motive. And then when somebody who is approved by God comes and jerks the rug out from under that garbage, you'll stand with the liar. Why? Hey family, I'm back with a brand new episode of Highly Motivated, where we have addicted ourselves to the ministry of the saints. Buckle up because today's show is going to be a wild one. We've got some great videos to talk about. Afterwards, we will be continuing with our Sound Doctrine series with our special guest, Dan, also known as Approved Unto God, where we are going from Romans all the way through to Philemon. Hopefully by the end, you will know exactly who you are in Christ and what your instructions are for today. Without further ado, let's get into today's video. Now, I'm positive that you all know exactly what AA is, Alcoholics Anonymous, but did you know that it has occult origins? I didn't. Let's watch this. What's happening in polite society? I hope you're having a good week. If you're here for the first time, welcome to my channel. I'm Alec. While it may be thought that Alcoholics Anonymous has Christian origins, the actual truth is quite different. Frank Bookman, I might be pronouncing that incorrectly, was a religious teacher who began a movement that was originally called a First Century Christian Fellowship. Later, the name was changed to the Oxford Group in 1928. Bookman once stated that he did not touch on any doctrine in his meetings because he did not want to upset or offend anyone. This enabled him to appeal to persons from many different religious persuasions. This religious group influenced Dr. Bob Smith and Bill Wilson, the founders of AA. Wilson's alleged conversion is bizarre, to say the least. The former alcoholic had fallen into a deep depression. One day, he suddenly saw his room illuminate with a great white light. He described being caught up into an ecstasy and thinking to himself that this was the god of the preachers. Wilson never touched alcohol again after the encounter. 
The two founders of AA were originally introduced to each other by a woman named Henrietta. In a 1952 letter, she wrote about how Wilson often communicated with spirits during the time period he formulated the Alcoholics Anonymous program. The official Alcoholics Anonymous biography of Wilson reveals that even years after the founding of AA, seances were still being regularly held at the Wilson residence. Consulting the Ouija board was also a regular practice. The biographer writes that Wilson would lie down on his couch and get things every week or so. Certain individuals, I take them to be dark spirits, would come with sentences. The words would tumble out with rapid speed. Wilson himself does not identify any specific entity in relation to the writing of the 12 Steps. He does, however, give credit to the spirit of a departed bishop when he was writing the manuscript for 12 Steps and 12 Traditions. There are probably many criticisms that could be made of AA. However, I am not a pastor, elder, or biblical counselor. As a result, I will leave it to someone who is more qualified to address how to properly minister to someone who struggles with alcohol addiction. I am a Bible student, however, and therefore I will restrict my criticism to one aspect of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is antithetical to scripture. AA has a well-known mantra that most of us have probably heard. Hello, my name is, whatever your name happens to be, and I'm an alcoholic. This phrase is spoken at Alcoholics Anonymous meetings throughout the world every single day. On the AA official website, an answer to one frequently asked question. Part of the answer from AA was, we in AA believe there is no such thing as a cure for alcoholism. I'm not sure if all AA members must affirm that they are an alcoholic before each meet, but if someone is a Christian who is a former addict, the idea that he needs to identify as an alcoholic is contrary to Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Here the apostle gives a limited list of the unrighteous offenders who will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, I'm going to let him read it, but then I'm going to go back in after and read it out of the KJV. Notice that he includes drunkards on the list, but also notice that he concludes with such were some of you. There are many different sins that all of us struggle with. For some of us, it is drinking. But after God rescues us, our identity is in Jesus Christ. Amen. Not in our former sins. Well, I hope this brief video on AA helped you out. The source material I used is available in the video description below. That's a wrap for now, ladies and gents. If you want to share your own thoughts, be sure to do so in the comment section down below. Now, the verses that he read, the way they are written in the King James is this. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And that was really one of the things that always bothered me about AA or NA. Uh, generally, when you go to those meetings, the people who are there are there because they have to be. They're on probation or in some sort of treatment, and they're not there because they want to be. And I felt like it was just a place to meet people who did the things I didn't want to do, right? And I really appreciate how in uh, 1 Corinthians 6.11, it says, as such were some of you. That means that when Christ changes you, you're changed. You're not going to revert back. You have a new heart, a new mind. You are a new creature. So the way that they present their program is inherently anti-Christ if it's going against what the Word of God says. What you focus on grows, right? So if you're focusing on the fact that you're always going to be an alcoholic no matter what like doesn't that it's a little defeating don't you think like it, it makes somebody feel hopeless like okay great i can stop drinking but i'm always gonna be this um i, I don't agree i don't know let me know what you guys think in the comments
Now, our next clip is from a video that is titled The Elton Anomaly, 7 by 7 Infallible Proof the King James Bible is God's Word. Wait till you see how he did this. The King James Bible in its absolute entirety consists of 823,543 words and numbers. Seven to the seventh power total words, numbers that form the King James Bible. Seven to the power of seven. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. Now, I'm not, I was going to say I'm not sure what Bible he's reading, but obviously it's the KJV. <laughs> Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. John 5, 39. Seven times seven times seven times seven times seven times seven times seven. The entire Bible. Seven is God's number of completion. Seventy-seven thousand seven hundred and seventy-seven total mentions first and last words of first and last verses. Seven hundred and seventy-seven plus seven hundred and seventy-seven total mentions of Jesus plus Christ. 777 total mentions of the Father plus the Word plus Holy Ghost. <laughs> All glory and praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. Seven to the seventh power. God is good, every guys. Every single word, every single number. Basically, what it, it, here's what it is. It's the words of the Bible married to the structure of the Bible. It's the combination of both of them. Because you're looking at the book titles, including the cover of the Bible, the, the name of the whole Bible, the book, the volume of the book, including chapters, verses, and then the words. You're including everything. Seven times seven times seven times seven times seven times seven times seven. Exactly. With the 666, you see 666 verses that mention all three of the people, persons that are associated with that number in the Bible, with the number itself. Have you seen that video? You see all these perfection, perfect things with the first and last verses and with Jesus and the Father and Son. And all of these perfect things are within that, are within seven to the seventh power. So when anybody who thinks that verse divisions were just put in by man, yeah. God had a plan. Just like the rest of the Bible was written by a man, inspired by the Holy Ghost. Amen. The whole thing was meant to come together. A verse is coming to mind that I've covered before, but it's, I mean, more than ever applies now. At the end of John 15, Jesus says, When the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. This book is the testimony, the sworn testimony of Jesus Christ. When God swears by himself, he seventh himself. So his word, when he sevens his word, he, he's doing it by an oath. Like he, he can swear by no greater, so he swears by himself. In Psalms it says that he has magnified his word above all his name. Amen. The reason for that is because it's just like when you have a king. Do we have a perfect word of God? or not. And the fact that these anomalies only come together with the KJV 
including the chapters and the verses. And so it it just shows that this was God's plan. This is his perfect word. It does not work in any other translation. Praise God. Now, this was news to me, but apparently the U.S. government is talking about implementing a $50 an hour minimum wage. Now, before you get excited, this actually is very concerning news, and this gentleman is going to explain why. You guys, oh my God, watch this. So we got to talk about something very, very important, because when you see this happen, understand what this means. We're going to talk about a $50 minimum, minimum wage throughout America. And why would America make a federally uh, law to make minimum wage $50 an hour? Well, guys, right now, I believe that we are in the first stages of the dollar being replaced. So when you see the government say, you know what, forget it and cut the money printer on and say, we're, we're going to do a $50 minimum wage throughout the entire country, meaning if your job pays more than that, they're probably going to raise you up even higher. So you're going to see things like houses, cars. You, you, you might see a $200,000 car. You might see a $3 million house, but your wages will now be minimum wage of 50 and you might make a hundred bucks an hour or 150 bucks an hour on your on your normal job. So you're going to see this happen and you're hearing it here first. But just just know what that is. I can't say what it is, but it starts with a hyper. And when hyper happens, you guys know what, what, what that means. And if you don't know what hyper go look up Zimbabwe and Venezuela to see what happened when their currency went hyper. I'm out. You might as well wipe your behind with it. What's going on here? Could this be happening? Americans, do you think this is a good thing? Please leave a comment below. Thanks again for watching. This. You know, uh, that a lot of people are probably like, yeah, $50 an hour. I could do so much with that. Yeah, if prices stay the way they are right now. But do you, what do you think is going to happen the second they are paying people that amount? Exactly what this guy says. You're going to be paying, what, $100 for a gallon of milk? And I know that sounds extreme, but if our money is basically worthless, things are just going to get more and more expensive. They're just going to keep printing more and more. And this is a very good way for them to segue into their uh, central bank digital currency. This next clip was taken by a student in this teacher's class. And yes, this is what this teacher was teaching. I'm gender neutral, so I am not a female, nor am I a male. I would be in between. So right here would be my pronouns. So instead of she or he, you would refer as Z. Instead of her or him, you would refer as Zer. Instead of her or his, it would be Zer. Yes, in the back. Yes, this is what your tax dollars are paying for. And if you're questioning why your child is not good at math, can't read well, can't write, well, this is why, because this is the focus. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm confused. Um, are you, are you Mr. Darren, Miss Darren? No, I am Teacher Darren. There would be no Mr. or Mrs. in front of that, just <laughs> Teacher Darren. I'm confused. I'm what are you confused about? You should be confused because this isn't normal. He's like the mental patient that doesn't know he's mental. I'm confused over the whole thing. Why do we have to learn this? Well, because this Why do we have to learn this? This is how the world is changing now. So the world progresses and we progress with the world. Yes. yes, in the back. Can, can we just call you by what you look like your pronouns are? No, because that would be disrespectful. So my pronouns are Z, Zer, Zer, Zers, and Zer self. Or you can just call me Teacher Darren. This is insanity. You know, I never knew anything about any one of my teachers. Teachers did not talk about their 
husbands, their wives, their gender identity, their sexual preference. Like these are things that children don't need to know. They're there to learn reading, writing, math, history. I mean, uh, granted, they're being taught fake history and um, some pseudoscience, but I would prefer that over this. Come on. Footage of P. Diddy assaulting Cassie has actually surfaced. Now, I'm going to play the video, and I'm sure you've probably seen it, but I just want to remind everyone of his reaction when this allegation first came out. So for, let's just watch it first. Footage has just surfaced the internet of P. Titty physically assaulting his ex-girlfriend Cassie Ventura. Although it is slightly blurred out, you will be seeing the footage that CNN has retrieved, so viewer discretion is advised. This occurred in March of 2016 in a Los Angeles hotel. Cassie filed a lawsuit against Diddy last year, and they settled the next day. The details filed in the lawsuit almost exactly match what you see in front of your eyes. The lawsuit says that Diddy was intoxicated punched her in the face and gave her a black eye. She tried to escape. Diddy then woke up, chased her down the hallway, attempted to throw glass faces at her, threw her to the ground, kicked her, and tried to drag her back to the hotel room. She is then seen trying to pick up the phone. Diddy goes back to his room, and then he comes back and shoves her into the corner. He then sits down and then throws something in her direction. Now, can I just say that towel held on for dear life? It did not come off. But so he has actually released a apology and I'm not going to play it because honestly, uh, it's BS if you ask me. Um, but let and this is why I know it's BS, because when this happened, this is the statement uh, when her lawsuit came out. This was his statement. He said enough is enough. For the last couple of weeks, I have sat silently and watched people try to assassinate my character, destroy my reputation and my legacy. Sickening allegations have been made against me by individuals looking for a quick payday. Let me be clear. Wait, let me be absolutely clear. I did not do any of the awful things being alleged. I will fight for my name, my family, and for the truth. Sean Diddy Combs. Well, Mr. Combs, um, seems like that was all complete lies. So... Your apology is not an apology. It's damage control. Shout out to all my fellow black sheep. The black sheep is the strongest member of the toxic family dynamic because the black sheep is carrying generational trauma on their back. And the not only generational trauma, sorry for pausing already, we carry the blame for all of the familial problems. Black sheep refuses to be programmed. Everyone else is like mindless zombies, programmed, acting like nothing is wrong and they have normalized toxicity. But the black sheep says, no, this isn't normal. Despite all the things that happens to the black sheep, the smearing, the gaslighting, devaluing and discarding, the black sheep stands as a fierce on their own. Amen. And you know what? When you have the adults in your life telling you that you're bad, uh, blaming all of the family's problems on you, sometimes you do grow up to be exactly what they said you were. Maybe not forever, but you know. It's almost like they're cursing you when they say you're never going to amount to anything. You're a loser. I mean, they're programming you. And so these things do affect you into your adult life. And, you know, for me, I didn't heal from a lot until I had Jesus as my head. You know, I, I have a contentment that I was not able to find un until Jesus changed my life.
And something that I've noticed through, you know, talking with other members of the body of Christ is that a lot of us were the black sheep of our families. I wonder if there's something to that. Now, the title of this video, and it's an old one, as you can see, it's in black and white. Uh, it's called Now You Know Why the Media and the Government Say democracy. A democracy is a political system in which the people periodically, by majority vote at the polls, select their rulers. The rulers then have absolute power to make whatever laws they please by majority vote among themselves. In a constitutional republic, the people also, by majority vote at the polls, select rulers who make laws by majority vote among themselves. But the rulers cannot make any laws they please because the Constitution severely restricts their lawmaking power. The ideal of a democracy is universal equality. The ideal of a constitutional republic is individual liberty. In this century, great strides have been made toward the goal of subverting our republic and transforming it into a democracy. The foremost tactic of the subverters is subversion of language. By calling America a democracy until people thoughtlessly accept and use the term, totalitarians have obscured the real meaning of American principles of government. Writers of the Constitution were anxious to safeguard liberty against dictatorship, monarchy they called it. But their chief anxiety was to protect the country against democracy. Edmund Randolph, delegate to the Constitutional Convention from Virginia, said the general object of the convention was to provide a cure for the follies and fury of democracy. Elbridge Gerry and Roger Sherman, delegates from Massachusetts and Connecticut, urged the Constitutional Convention to create a system to eliminate the evils that flow from the excess of democracy. Alexander Hamilton, delegate from New York, said, We are now forming a Republican government. Real liberty is not found in democracy. If we incline too much to democracy, we shall soon shoot into a monarchy. John Adams, one of the giants of the American Revolutionary period, said, Democracy will envy all, contend with all, endeavor to pull down all. And when by chance it happens to get the upper hand for a short time, democracy will be revengeful, bloody, and cruel. America was founded not as a democracy, but as a constitutional republic. We pledge allegiance to the republic for which our flag stands, not to a democracy. The Constitution requires a republican form of government for all states, but does not mention democracy, and neither does the Declaration of Independence or the Bill of Rights. Foreman asked him what kind of government the convention had given America. And Franklin replied, a republic, if you can keep it. Very old and very wise, Franklin saw through the mists of time to the day when Americans might trade their freedom in a constitutional republic for the promise of government guaranteed equality and security in a democracy. And beyond that, to the day when democracy inevitably degenerates into dictatorship, guaranteeing nothing but poverty and serfdom for the people it robs and rules. And that makes two reasons why they took the Pledge of Allegiance out of schools. One, because it said one nation under God. Two, because it says we are a republic. What comes after democracy? Fascism. Any attempt to restrict drinking and driving here is viewed by some as downright undemocratic. It's kind of getting common this when a fella can't put in a hard day's work, put in 11, 12 hours a day, and then get in your truck and at least drink one or two beers. They're making it laws where you can't drink when you want to. You, can't, you have to wear a seat belt when you're driving. And pretty soon we're going to become this country. 95% of the U.S. population is brainwashed into believing that working 50 years of their life on a job that they don't really want to do and trading all of that for 5 to 10 years of quote-unquote freedom, but it's not really freedom because you're old and you can't even enjoy it. It is unrealistic. It is quite frankly stupid. Uh, The Vatican has announced a new declaration on the paranormal. Vatican decided to hold a press conference to discuss 
their new rules on apparitions and paranormal um, phenomena. They were doing this because they saw cases where local bishops um, or bishops of a region would rapidly declare a phenomenon's supernatural nature, right. only for the holy office to have to express a different decision later. Drop in. Here so we go. Drop in. The rules that we present today are a guide to discern the situations that can happen in the Christian community outside the ordinary. Visions, Ooh. apparitions. Ooh. I know, right? It's fun. It's spicy. It's fun when the when the serious uh, churchy men up in their little <laughs> castle yeah. start to talk about crazy things. Mm -hmm. We had decided to have six possible conclusions. Okay. Now, mind you, they have named them all in Latin. I do not speak Latin, so forgive me if I don't pronounce them all entirely correctly. But the first one is Nile Obstat. Without expressing any certainty about the supernatural authenticity of the phenomena itself, many signs of the action of the Holy Spirit are acknowledged. The bishop is encouraged to appreciate the pastoral value and promote the dissementation uh, dis of the phenomena, including pilgrimages. Okay. Then, the second outcome is pre oculus uh, habitur, um, although important positive signs are recognized, some aspects of confusion or potential risks are also perceived that require the diocesan bishop to engage in a careful discernment in dialogue with the recipients of a given spiritual experience. If there were writings or messages, doct uh, doctrinal clarification must be necessary. Uh, then we have curator. Various or significant critical elements are noted, but the phenomenon is already spread widely and verifiable spiritual fruits are connected to it. <laughs> spiritual fruit. Spiritual fruit. You know those demonic spiritual fruits. But the mango. The, not the Domango. <laughs> the Domango. But <laughs> therefore, a ban that could upset the faithful is not recommended, but the local bishop is advised to not encourage the phenomenon. Then we have sub mandato. Okay. The critical issues are not connected to the phenomena itself, but it to its improper use by people or groups such as undue fin uh, as undue financial gain or immoral acts. The Holy See entrusts the pastoral leadership of the specific place to the diocesan bishop or a delegate. So this okay. is like that we know for a fact they are yeah. not telling the truth and they're just trying to cause a rise out of things. Then we have prohibitor et obstrateur. Um, despite various positive elements, the critical issues and risks associated with this phenomena appear to be very serious. Hmm. The, the dicastery asks the local bishop to offer a cate catechis, catechis? Catechist. Uh, that can help the faithful understand the reasons for the decision and reorient their legitimate spiritual concerns. Hmm. So they're like, so they want to be completely in charge to be able to tell people officially that what they're seeing is or isn't real. Am I am I getting this correct? Like, you wait, more stolen authority? Gee, sounds familiar. You need to stop that. <laughs> <laughs> Knock it out. Uh, then we have the Declaratio de non supernatural supernatural. Liate, the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith or authorizes the local bishop to declare that the phenomena is found to not be supernatural based on concrete facts and evidence such as the confession of alleged visionary or credible testimonies of fabrication of the phenomena. Okay. So hmm. it seems to me like they know that there's going to be an awful lot of um, paranormal things that are going to be seen in the near future and it sounds like a almost like a pre-damage control what do you guys think we have time for one more video before we get into today's bible study causing problems you sound a little different than my pastor why because you gave the pastor the final authority not the word of god and then when your pastor comes up with a view or a motive you support that view and motive and then when somebody who is approved by god comes and jerks the rug out from under that garbage you'll stand with the liar why because you never followed up on it you never searched it out 
Never take anyone's word for it. Don't take my word for it. Go in the word of God yourself. Bad place to be. Yeah. Unaware that you're going to hell. It's one thing if you're going to hell and you know you're going to hell. But to be surprised about going to hell? Why would you want to do something like that for? What's wrong with you where you don't want to be with the rest of us? I was there. Me too. That's where I came from. Not wanting to be around anybody or anything. I want to just be alone. Didn't want to go to heaven. Didn't want to go to hell. Just didn't want to exist. Wanted the weight of the world off of me and all the problems. Yeah. Getting upset at someone for showing you something that you did not know. Um, even if it is different than what you've heard from your preacher at your pulpit, if you immediately dismiss it without looking and trying to reprove it to see if maybe what they're saying has some truth to it, then, you know, it's actually dangerous because you can't rely on someone else to study the Bible for you. You know, um, you can learn a lot through someone else, but there really is no replacement for getting into the word yourself. And that's also a reason why I've been incorporating more scripture into our show, because let's face it, it is the most important thing today is God, the word of God, where we're going to go when this is over. Like there really isn't anything that tops that. All right, I want to welcome Daniel, a.k.a. Approved Unto God, for our Sound Doctrine series. Um, we are starting today in Romans chapter 2. We're going to read the whole chapter, and we're also going to do some cross-references. So, verse 1. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. And the cross reference for that verse is Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and godhead so that they are without excuse amen but we are sure that the judgment of god is according to the truth or excuse me according to truth against them which commit such things and thinkest thou this o man that judgest them which do such things and doest the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of god or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? The cross references, the first cross reference for that is Romans 3.25. Ready? Yep. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Our second cross reference is Romans 9 verse 23. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. And then we have another cross-reference for that verse. It is Ephesians 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. His grace. Amen. Continuing on, Romans chapter 2, verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, 
treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. And we have a cross-reference for that as well. It is Galatians 2, verse 6. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. And that is something that you see uh, once you your eyes are opened to how you're supposed to read the Word of God. Uh, there are so many teachers that you thought had the message down. You thought they knew, and then you realize what they they have no idea. They're mixing up different doctrines and. Um, applying things that belong to Israel to themselves, calling themselves the bride and the body of Christ simultaneously. Like it, it, you get stuck in the mud, which mud equals mixed up doctrine. Mishandling the word of God. Exactly. It's a double edged sword. If you mishandle it, you can cut yourself and someone else. Continuing in Romans chapter 2, we're on verse 12. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Verse 15, which shew the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Whose gospel? Paul's Amen. gospel. Now we have some cross references for this as well. We've got Romans. Chapter 3, verse 16. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And our second is Ecclesiastes 12, 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Amen. You cannot hide from the Lord Jesus Christ. Back in Romans chapter 2, verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. We have some cross references for that. Actually, we have one, and it is Philippians verse 1, chapter 10. Or, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 10. <laughs> that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere without offense to the day of Christ. And now the day of Christ, it, it, which day is that exactly, Daniel? Mm, the day of Christ is, uh, I think that's we... We get caught up, and the day of the Lord is different. Okay, I, I was I thought that meant I could have that backwards though. Either one. Okay. Same. One. 
Right. The day of the Lord and the day of Christ are different. I believe you're right that the day of Christ is when he comes and we are caught up. Uh, any of you in the comments, if you uh, if we're wrong, if you could clear it up for us, please. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Verse 19. And are confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Uh, we have a cross-reference for that. It's Romans 6, verse 17. <clears throat> but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. And and Dan, please, what form of doctrine is that? Sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. Exactly why we are doing a sound doctrine series. Back in Romans chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 21. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For uncircum or excuse me, for circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Uh, and we have a cross reference for that. It is Galatians chapter five, verses three and four. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you whatsoever of you are justified by the law. Ye have fallen from grace. Exactly. If you choose to follow the law during this time of grace, you are no longer under grace. So you better hope that you've got that whole law. I mean, because it's not just the Ten Commandments. It's a, there's, it's a lot more than that. I, I My advice is to get into grace while it's here because this grace period is not forever. Things are going to change after we are caught up. We will be in a new dispensation. Verse 26, Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. Our cross-reference for that verse is Romans chapter 7, verse 6. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve a newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letters. Amen, because we are what? Dead, hid in Christ. Christ fulfilled the law. We are no longer to be living by the law. Verse 29. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. 
our cross, we have two cross references for the last verse. We've got Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off of the body of sins, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Amen. And our last cross reference is Philippians. Chapter 3, verse 3. For we are the circumcision which worship Jesus, which worship God in the spirit and rejoiced in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Amen. Amen. Have no confidence in the flesh. The flesh has fallen. We are to renew our hearts and minds daily. Uh, we are new creatures in Christ. The old man passes away and we become new. And so if you are, if you have come to Christ and nothing about your life has changed, then I would really look deep inside and make sure that you are not believing in vain because Christ finishes the work. We're glad to have you guys here joining and learning with us daily, growing in the knowledge of our Lord. This is our daily bread. This is our daily workout. So we're going to be here day in and day out uh, for the glory of Jesus Christ. Uh, until next time, I love you all in Christ. Grace and peace. Amen. Thanks for joining me again, Dan. I appreciate it. So next week, we will be continuing on into chapter three, and I'm excited to continue to learn and grow in the Lord with my YouTube family. I love you guys, and I thank you for joining us once again. Until next time, stay prayed up and stay highly motivated.